I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Nobody knows am I doing enough. There is no guarantee, there is no assurance. This limbo is always, always is in your mind as a Muslim. Born in Iran, raised in a strict Shia family, Muhammad Faridi was taught he had one purpose in life. My goal as a Muslim was to satisfy a God that I didn't know, a God that I couldn't get to know. So everything I did, everything I read, studied, it was about to fulfill that particular goal, to keep him satisfied with me, to have his approval. Allahu Akbar, Allah. From childhood, he prayed and fasted and memorized the Quran. Because the belief is that if you memorize the Quran, you cannot be burned in hell because the verses of the Quran are eternal and they are pure. When it's in your mind, that mind cannot be burned in hell. I was always in constant fear. Then as a teenager, he started ritual flagellations to earn Allah's approval. We have chains, we have uh, swords that we beat ourselves with it to punish ourselves in order to um, pay for our sins, to show how sorrowful we are. But there was only one way he could secure his place in paradise. The only guarantee, according to chap uh, chapter 5 of the Quran, is, is jihad and being a slay or a slain for the cause of Islam. That's the only guarantee you will find in, in the doctrine of Islam. Muhammad hoped to get his chance in battle when he served his two years of mandatory military service after high school. But war never broke out, and when his army career came to an end, Muhammad grew frustrated and depressed. I knew as a Muslim if I commit suicide, I will definitely end up in hell. At this time, I'm living in hell. If I kill myself, I'm end up in hell. So I had this dilemma. I was a stuck. I really was a stuck. Then one day, he met up with a friend that he hadn't seen since high school. Right away, Mohammed noticed something different about him. He was very mellow, very peaceful, and it bothered me to the point that I'd said, what is going on with you today? There's something very different today. And then he said that he became a Christian. And he started um, explaining about the goodness of God. He talked about the love of God and how his relationship with God, that is through Jesus Christ, has changed our lives. I tried to defend myself. I tried to prove him wrong. But after two hours of intense arguments, I was an echo of what the Imam in the mosque told me. I had nothing that I could stand on as a Muslim because I didn't know God. But the way my friend was talking about Jesus, it was like talking about a friend of him, a personal guy that he actually knew. Out of desperation, I fell on my knees and I, t and I asked him, what do I need to do to receive him? Everything that I had to do on my own as a Muslim to beat myself, to bruise myself, to shed my own blood, to become a sacrifice, he said, it's already done in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you believe in him, you will have eternal life. And it was simple, but it was the most amazing good news, the true good news I've ever heard in my life. Finally, Muhammad discovered the personal relationship with God that he had always desired. Something within me that was always in, in war with me, always restless, it was like a cancer that always bothered me, never was satisfied. That moment when I made that commitment, when I um, prayed that prayer, it was like yanked out of me. And for the first time in my life, I felt peace. Muhammad was excited but worried about telling his family. According to Sharia law, they would have every right to kill him. So I had to choose between my family and my heavenly family. And um, at that time, I counted the costs and I said, I, I will choose my heavenly family 
regardless of what's going to happen. When he did eventually tell them, his family tried to persuade him back to Islam. But Muhammad was convinced that Jesus was the one true God. The more I read this New Testament, the Gospels, the more it connected to me, the more it spoke, it spoke to me. The Gospels show uh, the hypocrisy of Islam to me. For the next two years, he attended underground churches and grew in his faith. Eventually, he fled to Turkey, fearing for his life. After three years of interviews and waiting, he was granted religious asylum in the United States. God is a good God, and what he has done through Jesus Christ for us will change our lives for good and for eternity to put us in a right standing with God in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Today, Muhammad never misses a chance to share the personal relationship he has with God. I was a very uncertain person as a Muslim, but when I came to the knowledge and understanding of what, who Jesus is and what he has done for me, that love, that hope, you cannot find it in any other places, especially in Islam. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Humanity has faced two monumental questions since we first stood on two feet. Why are we here, and are we alone in the universe? Well, we may actually be closer to answering the latter. A study out of the UK is fueling theories that there are 36 intelligent alien races in just our galaxy alone. Joining me now to break it all down, theoretical physicist and author of The Future of Humanity, Michio Kaku. When I read about this late last week, you're the first person I thought of. <laughs> so maybe we're getting closer to answering that question. Is there life outside of this, uh, outside of, uh, the, of Earth? Well, that's the greatest existential question of all time. Are we alone in the universe? Let's do a science experiment. Go outside tonight, look up, see the Milky Way galaxy. You are now staring at 100 billion stars in our backyard, the Milky Way galaxy, and then make a ballpark estimate. How many of those stars have planets? How many of those planets have oceans? How many of those oceans have fish and aquatic life? How many of them have intelligent life? And so this is called Drake's equation. Trying to get a ballpark estimate of how many civilizations there are in the galaxy. And that's where they came up with the number 36. They took a bare bones, stripped down Drake's equation to get that number. It's a fascinating number, and it's encouraging. Uh, and I guess the question, though, is will, when or will, will they reveal themselves? Why haven't they revealed themselves? And, and what can we expect? Are they going to be more intelligent than we are? Well, I think that one day they may actually land on the White House lawn and announce their existence. <laughs> However, as Stephen Hawking cautioned us, we have to be careful because remember when Cortez met Montezuma in Mexico. Cortez had steel, yeah. he had gunpowder, he had the horse, he had the written language, and the Aztecs had none of those. And within just a matter of a few months, the Aztec civilization collapsed. So let's hope that they are peaceful. I think they are, but let's hope they are peaceful when they land on the White House lawn. Before you leave office, will you let us know if there's aliens? Because this is the only thing I really want to know. I, I want to know what's going on. Would you ever open up Roswell and let us know what's really going on there? So many people ask me that question. I know, yeah. it sounds almost ridiculous, no, but it's actually the real question I want to know. It like a cute question, but it's actually, there are millions and millions of people that want to go there, that want to see it. I won't talk to you about what I know about it, but it's very interesting. But Roswell's a very interesting place with a lot of people that would like to know what's going on. So you're saying you may declassify? No. You'll, you'll, you'll take it? Well, I'll, I, I'll have to think about that one, right? Uh, I'll have well, to think. Could an alien deception be the strong delusion God sends on an unbelieving and unrepentant world in the last days? Recently, interest has been rising in the theory that an alien deception will be part of the end times. 
Odd as it may seem, this theory is entirely plausible from a Christian perspective. Although the Bible gives us no word about whether or not aliens exist, there is no inclusion of them in the creation account in Genesis, and no mention of them elsewhere. The Bible does tell us about visitors from another world, the spiritual world, as we read in Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Could this phenomenon be the strong delusion of the last days that is talked about in the Bible? 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Why is God sending a strong delusion? The Bible makes it clear. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Simply put, God sends a strong delusion to those who choose not to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah puts it succinctly. Just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions, and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. Christians must deal with this from a biblical worldview, and not be caught up in the deception that UFOs are anything but agents of the prince of the power of the air, aka Satan. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. There is not one but two unusual weather events impacting the planet this week. The first is the migration of a major dust cloud from the Sahara across the Atlantic Ocean. That is expected to hit the United States by the end of the week. The second is a remarkable heat wave in the Arctic with temperatures as high as 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. This is something that is coming at a time when the United States and the rest of the world is dealing with this coronavirus pandemic. Texas is already dealing with an increase in coronavirus cases, and now it's likely to get hit by what some are calling the Godzilla Sahara dust cloud. What can people in Texas expect to see this weekend? This is the largest dust cloud that I've ever seen moving across the Caribbean. Uh, some say it's the worst that we've seen in, in 50 years. So visibilities are incredibly reduced. The before and after pictures across the Caribbean are incredible. And we have an article on CBSNews.com that you can check out those before and after photos. So this is really reducing the air quality, in some cases less than a half a mile visibility. And this poses respiratory concerns, not only in the Caribbean, but as you mentioned, it's headed towards Texas. And of course, Texas has a very high incidence right now of COVID-19. And so this is coincident. It's happening at the same time. We have this big dust plume moving into Texas at the same time when their cases are going up. Obviously, when you have that much dust, it can compromise people's respiratory systems. And of course, COVID-19 goes for people's respiratory systems. So we're concerned about that. It will get there on Thursday. It'll be thick on Friday and Saturday and then begin to move out on Sunday. But as it moves out, it's going to be making kind of a right hook, moving through basically all of the southeast and most of the middle Atlantic states, even parts of the Tennessee and southern Ohio Valley are going to see effects of this. And by the way, most of these dust plumes tend to kind of dilute and disperse a little bit. 
This one does not look like it's going to do so very much. So conditions are real bad in the Caribbean, and they're not going to be much better once this reaches Atlanta, Birmingham, Nashville, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and into Richmond, Virginia, and probably Washington, D.C. as well. Well, moving on to the heat wave hitting the Arctic. This is remarkable. It got up to 100.4 degrees earlier wow. this week, which is likely the hottest temperature ever recorded there. Tell us what's happening. Yeah, I mean, we've been seeing a ton of these heat waves in different places. It's not always in Siberia, but it's often been in Siberia, in the Arctic over the past five years. You know, part of this is due to natural fluctuations in weather patterns, but it's getting really hard to say that climate change is not making a big impact. We know it's making an impact. It's seemingly making a, a big impact now. Climate change is, is like the steroids. It takes a, a normal weather pattern and, and it infuses it with steroids. I mean, it's 100, it was 100.4 degrees in the Arctic. Now, I should say that in history, there have been a couple of times where temperatures have gotten to around 100 degrees in and around the Arctic Circle, literally a couple of times since we've been keeping records. But this would be the highest temperature ever in the Arctic. It has been warm since December and January. In fact, uh, temperatures in western Siberia have averaged about 10 degrees above normal Fahrenheit for all of those months. If you average all of those five months or so, um, and in terms of its departure from normal, it is twice that of the highest departure from normal before, back in 2016. So, you know, this is astonishing. As a meteorologist who's been doing, who's been doing this a long time, it's incredible. And just today alone, uh, some temperatures in, in parts of Siberia, 40 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, and fires have ignited all across Siberia and a lot of smoke as well. Just about 12 days ago, there were a few fires, and now there's dozens and dozens and dozens in Siberia. Well, is this a one-time occurrence? Can we expect to see more of this more often in years to come? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, look, it may not be always in the same place. Right now, it's in central Siberia. Um, it may move to a different part of Siberia, you know, different season, maybe later in the summer, maybe next year or the year after. Uh, it may move to Canada and, and Alaska. Alaska's been getting a lot of heat waves. Um, so basically, the weather pattern, the incident weather pattern at that time kind of determines where it's going to be. And then climate change comes in and really pumps it up. So it will move. It will not always be in the same place, but you can bet your bottom dollar that we're going to see a lot more of these and a lot more intense heat waves in the future. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. It began in Mexico where a magnitude 7.4 earthquake hit the southern coastline Tuesday. At least five people were killed and many others were evacuated. So far we've only seen five people confirmed dead and perhaps 30 more have been injured in this earthquake, but it was quite a ride. It went for anything between 90 seconds to two minutes. And as you mentioned, 7.4 earthquake is no joke. The buildings were swaying around me, people very scared in the street, and windows, a lot of them, breaking around us as this earthquake went on. 
A powerful earthquake has hit southern Mexico's Pacific coast, killing several people with more wounded. The fatalities were near the quake's epicenter in Oaxaca, where some 200 houses were left scarred by huge cracks across walls, some with severe damage. Vincente Romero was one of many despondent homeowners. Everything is damaged here. It's taken the house. Everything that we've done in our lives is gone. So, right now, we're waiting to see what comes next, because we can't live in this house anymore. We've lost everything, in one moment, to nature. The magnitude 7.4 quake even caused damage to buildings hundreds of miles away in Mexico City. Resident Aurea Preiser was forced to evacuate her apartment building. Memory in Mexico City is still strong of the 2017 quake that killed hundreds. This building, this apartment, has always been my home. I was born there, I grew up there, and I have all my memories there. And if I were to lose it, I wouldn't just lose my home, I would lose a very large part of my heart. Rockfalls blocked winding mountain roads between the state capital, Oaxaca, and the coast and rescue workers battled for hours to reach the settlement near the epicenter, where officials say the quake brought down homes as well as parts of the mountainside. Luke 2111, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. It was a country that boasted one of the highest standards of living in Africa. According to Pan-African news platform, The African Exponent, under President Muammar Gaddafi, in Libya, education, health care, and even electricity were all free for citizens. Farmers enjoyed a high level of support from the government. Mothers were taken care of after giving birth. Bank loans were interest-free. A home was deemed a natural human right. And the literacy rate jumped from 25% to 75% under Gaddafi. But then along came NATO. In 2011, alliance forces backed a rebellion against Gaddafi's government. That war came to an end when the country's leader was tortured and killed by Western-backed rebels on October 20th, 2011. A gruesome scene applauded by some. Yes, we came, we saw, he died. <laughs> but it's hard to overlook the fact that chaos has continued in Libya to this day. A variety of players have struggled to control the oil-rich nation. The two most prominent are military commander Khalifa Haftar's Libyan National Army, which has the backing of the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, France, and Russia, and the Tripoli-based government of National Accord, which is supported by the UN, Qatar, Italy, and Turkey. Officially, Libya is under an arms embargo, but somehow weapons keep pouring in. This Monday, Turkey and Italy announced that they are working together to stop the flow. Here's Italy's foreign minister. If we stop the arrival of arms or we severely limit the entrance, we will be able to reduce the aggressiveness of the two Libyan sides in this conflict. The same day, France accused its NATO ally, Turkey, of violating the weapons embargo. I already had the opportunity to clearly say it to President Erdogan. I consider today that Turkey plays in Libya a dangerous game and is in breach of all commitments it took during the Berlin conference. With alliance members going head to head in regard to Libya, the French president reiterated his statement from last year calling NATO brain dead once again. Turkish military interference in Libya has helped the government of National Accord achieve recent gains on the ground, making the situation even more complicated. This past weekend, Egypt's president warned that if Turkish-backed pro-GNA forces advance on the strategic city of Sirte, it could provoke a direct intervention by Cairo. The Turkish-backed GNA has called the announcement a declaration of war. With tension high, many nations, including the U.S. and Russia, are calling for an immediate ceasefire. We stressed the need for an early ceasefire in Libya and agreed on urging Libyan political forces to engage in constructive dialogue as soon as possible. If Egypt was provoked to follow through on its threat, it would bring the conflict to a new level. The battleground that has already become an international arena could easily spread into a regional war. 
The United States continues to be seriously worried about North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Washington also reiterated its vow to maintain sanctions on the regime until full denuclearization is achieved. Our Eason Jet reports. In its latest annual report on the U.S. and other nations' compliance with various arms control and non-proliferation agreements, the U.S. State Department raises the possibility that North Korea may have additional unidentified nuclear facilities. It adds that Washington continues to have significant concerns about Pyongyang's nuclear weapons program. According to the 79-page document, which was reported to Congress on Tuesday, the U.S. continues to closely monitor North Korea's nuclear activities. It says a final, fully verified denuclearization of North Korea remains the overriding U.S. objective, and it remains committed to continued diplomatic negotiations with the regime toward that goal. The State Department also stated that North Korea did not adhere to its nuclear weapons obligations and commitments under its agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the U.S. government, and other members of the six-party nuclear talks. The department cited IAEA reports on activities detected at the North's main nuclear complex in Yongbyon, which includes the construction of an experimental light water reactor that could be used to produce fissile material for nuclear weapons. Despite the report, the State Department urged North Korea on Tuesday to return to engagement as the regime continues to threaten South Korea over anti-Pyongyang leaflet campaigns. Pyongyang has issued a barrage of threats throughout June, taking issue with Seoul's failure to stop defectors and activists sending leaflets over the border. Speaking to Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, a State Department spokesperson also reaffirmed that Washington remains in close coordination with South Korea over the matter. Seoul and Washington flew multiple surveillance flights over the Korean peninsula in recent days to strengthen the military's monitoring of the regime. Aviation tracker No Call Sign tweeted that a U.S. spy plane, the RC-12X Garrel, was spotted this morning. A day earlier, six of these surveillance aircrafts were seen along with an RC-135W rivet joint. Also spotted over the peninsula on Monday, a South Korean Air Force AWACS, the E-737 PSI. It's rare for eight of the Allies' spy planes to be operating on the same day. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. An angry mob tries to remove the statue of President Andrew Jackson in Washington, D.C. Across the country, cities are buckling to pressure and removing statues of Christopher Columbus. Now, growing calls for the removal of this statue of President Abraham Lincoln, who freed the slaves. The left-wing mob is trying to demolish our heritage so they could replace it with a new repressive regime that they alone control. The Department of Justice says left-wing groups, including Antifa, are leading instigators of protest violence. But who is Antifa? It's an anti-fascist group formed originally in Germany in the 1930s. They were Stalinists pledged to combating the Nazis. Here in America, these anarchists are based in the Northwest. One of their strengths uh, that makes them effective is they, they tr stay in the shadows, they don't have a head, regular headquarters, regular funding. So it makes it much harder to trace exactly what they're doing, and it lets them always claim, oh, well, that isn't us, and you can't prove it. According to Scott Walter, president of the Capital Research Center, some recruits seek meaning and significance by opposing authority. Almost anybody in Antifa is prepared to be violent. That's part of the essence of Antifa, is that you're, you're brave and tough and manly, and you're ready to be violent. Antifa's militant wing is called Redneck Revolt. 
One of its main goals, abolish police departments nationwide. The Redneck Revolt is a group active in some places, also goes by the name the John Brown Gun Club. If you know your Civil War history, of course, John Brown, shortly before the Civil War, uh, tried to have a violent revolt. An undercover reporter with Project Veritas recently infiltrated the group's North Carolina chapter. This particular group sees themselves as armed revolutionaries, and they believe in total abolition of everything, including the police. There were multiple chapters of Redneck Revolt that went to Charlottesville and acted as the militia wing of the anti-fascist movement. One of their missions is to arm minorities. Redneck Revolt invited the undercover journalist to the gun range. Initially accepted as a member, her social media activity led the group to eventually reject her. I had Facebook posts in support of a candidate for sheriff. And that's where they said to me, that's where we fundamentally disagree. We don't believe in reform of any kind. We believe in complete abolition of the system itself, including police. So who funds Antifa and Redneck Revolt? Walter says they don't need a lot of money. How much money does it cost to get a, a black hoodie uh, a black face mask uh, and a couple of bricks, right? You don't need multi-million dollar grants to do that. But how about other militant left-wing groups? And we can find some places where money like George Soros will fund something called the Alliance for Global Justice, and that is what's called a pass-through. It will then pass the money on to uh, individual groups like Refuse Fascism, which was an Antifa-style group that started after uh, Trump was elected. So what can be done to stop these violent leftist groups? President Trump is set to strengthen a statute against destroying monuments on federal property, which could mean up to 10 years in prison for violators. At least in the case of Antifa, President Trump and U.S. Attorney General William Barr want them designated as terrorists. John O'Connor, a former assistant federal prosecutor for Northern California, disagrees. You're burning the barn to roast the pig. I don't think you need to do it. I think if they are doing this in order to take advantage of some of the anti-terrorist laws, uh, which are created by statute, uh, I think you've got to show more of a foreign nexus. And that may be the Trump administration's biggest challenge in combating leftist violence. Overseas support may be hard to prove. For now, it seems these leftist groups, although inspired by foreign movements, are homegrown. They're made in America. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days, society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.